Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week, I have on Darius Dale from 42 Macro. Darius, thanks for joining. Joe, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing good, doing good. I definitely want to, you know, in this episode, I want to learn a little bit more about you as a person, like specifically about your childhood, where you came from, and how you ended up in Yale and, and eventually into the world of finance. Yeah, so that's a <laughs> that's a loaded and a half question, man. Where do you want to start? <laughs> Let's start your, I guess, a little bit about you, like specifically your childhood and your upbringing. I think you have an yes. interesting story. Yeah, so I, I do have a, a quite a unique background, I, I'd say, for uh, for finance in particular, for life generally, for, but for finance in particular. Uh, I grew up, um, you know, extremely poor, um, certainly by American standards, probably the poorest family in the country at, at one point. Um, you know, we were constantly being evicted. My parents were, uh, they struggled with uh, drug and alcohol abuse uh, throughout my childhood. So, you know, we were constantly being evicted, you know, constantly in the food bank lines, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, you know, you, you can kind of paint a picture of, you know, what that, that, that struggle was like on the inner city. Um, you know, but ultimately, uh, you know, I, I took the opportunities that were given to me at those times, those rare opportunities, and we, we took advantage of them. You know, I think, um, you know, kind of a, a short story, you know, kind of one of the main reasons I was, I'm here sitting in this chair today um, is actually sort of, you know, kind of, um, you know, the traditional making lemons out of lemonade, if you will. Um, we got evicted uh, the summer heading into my third grade year. Um, and I, and as a function of how the zoning system worked in, uh, in St. Louis, we were living in East St. Louis at the time, which at the time was the murder capital uh, of the country. Uh, we were living in a, a really rough neighborhood there and we got evicted and we had to live in this, um, homeless shelter, um, you know, heading into, uh, my third grade year. And as a function of how zoning worked in, in the St. Louis metropolitan area, uh, we, I wound up living sort of, I wound up having to go to school or getting to go to school rather. Uh, at this sort of charter school called Del Mar Harvard, you know, Harvard, like uh, our, our tribe up in Boston or in Cambridge. Um, and so that one year of like advanced accelerated learning, again, I'm living in a homeless shelter with, you know, drug addicts and men and homeless people um, for, for this entire year, uh, that year of living in the homeless shelter while I'm going to this school and, and getting that, that, you know, world-class, you know, elementary school education really set me up on this like very accelerated, um, you know, kind of course, if you will, for the rest of my childhood. And when I went back to my normal school district, and even when we moved to Seattle, um, heading into my sixth grade year, you know, I was still, you know, a grade or two grades ahead, pick, pick your, you know, pick your course or your curriculum than the rest of my classmates. And so I was always in the accelerated programs, AP programs, et cetera, all throughout high school. And, you know, in terms of how I got to Yale, and I'll be quick, um, you know, I obviously wound up being a pretty good football player. Um, you know, in, when you grow up in Seattle, you know, you, everybody wants to play for the University of Washington. That's the powerhouse program there uh, in the pack. what was the Pac-10 back then for, for the young, young kids there. Um, you know, but it, it's, it was, uh, it was you know, I was get, starting to get recruited by Ivy League coaches and, and shout out to my coach, uh, high school football coach, Coach Burgraff. You know, I didn't know anything about the Ivy League. We didn't have the internet at home. Um, it's not anything that's something that you, you learn about when you're growing up in the inner city. So, um, I was actually shocked when schools like Yale and Harvard started to come recruit me because if only because I had no idea who they were, you know, I'm like, I'm living in Seattle, University of Washington, the big schools out there, if you want to go to a nice school, it would have been Stanford or something like that. So it was kind of quite the shock when I saw schools from New Haven, Connecticut and Cambridge, et cetera, recruiting me. But anyway, thank you to Coach Burgraff for, uh, for sending my VHS tape to those, to those colleges and ultimately kind of catalyzed that process. But to, to wrap it up, um, you know, this is sort of like late in the recruiting process, my senior year, and uh, Mr. McGowan, who's our, our, my, our AP marine biology teacher at our high school, who also was coincidentally the head of the marine biology University of Washington. We had this program where college professors would come and teach um, courses in our, in our school. He pulls me aside and he's like, hey, man, you're always getting pulled out of my class. Like, you know, like you're, you're halfway here, halfway out. All these coaches keep pulling you out of my class. Like, you need to figure out where you're going so like you can be here and be present. And he's like, so what school do you think you want to go to? And I'm, and I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, you know, I'm really waiting on the University of Washington, uh, Coach Goberson, uh, to offer me a scholarship. You know, like, you know, they said they're getting close to the process. We're getting close to that part of the process. And he pulls me aside and he goes, I'll do you a favor, man. I'm going to make sure Coach Goberson doesn't offer you a scholarship. Because um, he knew at the time, and, and it really God bless his heart for kind of realizing this, that I had no frame of reference to understand what a, what a life-changing experience Yale um, would have been. And he, and he told me, you know, Hey, look, man, you, I'm not going to make sure I'm not going to tell you where to go, but I'm going to give you some advice. Go to Yale. 
Um, and that was the school that was recruiting me the hardest at the time. So um, shout out to Coach Burgraff, uh, uh, Dr. McGowan, and, and all the other wonderful people. Uh, Miss Peck, my third grade elementary school teacher, uh, for, for being the reason I'm, I'm sitting in this chair today. So thanks for, uh, thanks for having me, and thanks for the question. Nice. Yeah, so I guess you had many, I guess, mentors like throughout your, your young days in school and in football. You know, like, do you mentor now? And then if so, like, how important do you think like those people were, like, were they critical to your success in, in school and football and, and, and life in general? Yeah, man. So I don't, I don't believe you can be successful without great mentors. Like, what is success, right? Like, success is a combination of preparation and luck. You know, like who teaches you? you? No one controls the luck, the luck factor, but you can certainly control your preparation and how you prepare is, in my opinion, uh, something that is gained by, you know, osmosis, gained by, um, you know, good, good instruction from, from watching the, the, the people who do it well, do it well uh, on a consistent basis. So, um, you know, yes, uh, mentoring is a very big part of my life. Um, you know, I co-head uh, the Yale football mentorship program um, to this day. Um, certainly involved with a number of, of community outreach organizations, not the least of which is uh, Project Come Up, which is something I'm very proud of as well. So, um, yeah, I, I'm a big believer that, you know, the, the best path out of the kinds of environments that I grew up in, you know, d drug and alcohol abuse, constantly getting evicted, physical abuse, you know, obviously a lot of the stuff that comes along with drug and alcohol abuse, you know, that stuff was, um, you know, it was a really challenging um, environment to grow up in. You know, obviously you had friends who get murdered and gang violence and things like that. It sucked. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's, it sucks growing up poor. It sucks growing up in the inner city. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we can always give back and pay it forward. And um, so that's a very big part of my life now. It's a big part of my life. Um, it will always be a big part of my life. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. I know we probably have a lot of uh, more younger audience, potentially maybe more like retail uh, investors or high school, college age, or just out of college. What like industry advice would you have? Like, would you recommend people go into finance nowadays, or would you recommend them do tech, or or what type of advice would you have if someone came to you and said, "Hey, Darius, what should I do after school?" Uh, the best advice I can give someone is do something you love, um, and I think it starts when you go to um, when you go to college. Like the one big mistake that I made in college is, you know, I didn't take enough hard classes that would have more effectively prepared me for what I do for a living. And part of the reason was when I got to Yale, you know, I went to this, you know, kind of, um, you know, inner city school. Granted, I was a great student there, you know, 4.0 student, all that stuff, you know, AP classes. But that stuff doesn't prepare you to go to an Ivy League school. You know, the kids who go to Ivy League schools are going to, you know, college pre preparatory schools that the presidents go to, et cetera. So when I got to that campus, you know, I was at a significant disadvantage, not from an intellect perspective, but just from the perspective of not having the school requisite skills that it takes to be successful in an environment like that, the time management skills, the study skills, the study habits, et cetera. So, you know, that stuff, um, that stuff really matters. Um, that stuff definitely matters. Um, but so in terms of like, um, going back to the question, like what advice would I give to, uh, to, to young, to, to folks graduating college or even in college, it's do something you love. And I genuinely mean that because, you know, you're going to spend a lot of time at work. You're going to spend most of your adult life at work. Let's be, let's be totally honest about that. So if you're not doing something you love, you're going to hate it. You're going to be very unactualized and it's going to cause stress and strife in your life. And it's going to manifest in really negative ways to the people around you. So, um, that's the number one thing I would say. So go, going back to this college example, go figure out what you love or at least figure, touch enough things in college so that you could figure out, uh, what you love in order to figure, in order to start making that 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 decision earlier, it could be law, it could be tech, it could be finance, it could be uh, digital asset and finance, it could be tradfi. Who knows what that is? I think so much of what we, so much of what we do in this country in terms of preparing kids for careers is about focusing on the career and working our way backwards. Whereas I think you should focus on what you love to do, what makes you happy, and work your way forward. Things will work themselves out if you're a smart, hardworking person that has average, you know, average people skills, you're going to be successful in this country. There's just, there's not a lot, the list of people who are smart with average people skills in this country that are unsuccessful is a very small list of people. Yeah, 100%. Speaking of uh, digital assets, how did you originally discover Bitcoin? Ooh, that's a great question. So shout out to my friend Omar Sebek um, over at Sasco Digital. Um, this is a, uh, Back in the fall of 2020, so obviously I'm, I'm a macroeconomist and macro strategist, and um, you know, fancy myself a decent macro risk manager as well. Um, 
you know, it's not like that. I was aware of Bitcoin the whole time, but it just wasn't really something that, you know, I was, um, you know, considered uh, to be a legitimate investment uh, vehicle um, for my, at least for my own personal capital. Uh, obviously, it's an investment vehicle for a lot of folks since 2009. But, you know, so really started kind of like studying Bitcoin as a liquidity indicator back in 2017 and in 2018. Uh, and it was a great leading indicator. Um, for the, the ultimate, the, ultimately the reduction in liquidity that we saw in financial markets in Q4 of 18 that caused the market to crash, stock market to crash, um, big, you know, big leading indicator by seven, eight, nine months. Um, so I've been studying Bitcoin and how it's sort of impacting broader financial markets, but I really started to dig in uh, on real Bitcoin and, and digital asset fundamentals back in the fall of 2020. Um, if you recall, you know, we were going into an election where we had uh, uh, President Biden or, or President Trump on one side and, uh, and, and, and Joe Biden on the other side. And you know, it was my belief that, you know, who, no matter who won the election, or, you know, that we were going to see an expansion uh, in fiscal policy. You know, it was the first time in, in going back to, I want to say, seven, the mid-70s where you had Ford and Carter going up against each other, where both sides of the aisle were sort of aligned on fiscal expansion. So no matter the outcome, we were going to see fiscal expansion. We had already gotten the aggressive monetary expansion. Fed was expanding its balance sheet by $120 billion a month uh, back then. So we, I came to the conclusion that, hey, look, I need to go buy the most sort of, I don't know if inflation hedge is the right word because, again, it's not really, you're not hedging for inflation. You're betting on inflation, rather. Um, you know, I, I wanted to go buy the asset that would probably go up the most um, um, if we got into an inflationary environment. Uh, which obviously, you know, we're still sitting here today in, in, in August of 2022 in that inflationary environment. So, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of confidence to make it a huge position. Um, but you know, uh, my friend Omar Sebek, again, over at Sasco Digital, um, you know, he gave me a lot of confidence. He, he really took me under his wing and sort of really helped me understand Bitcoin and, and digital assets, but particularly Bitcoin uh, as this sort of, um, you know, kind of an answer to a lot of different problems in society. Um, and it ultimately gave me the confidence to make that a good position. I think my cost basis was somewhere around 20000 which coincidentally I think is everybody's cost basis, it seems like, just given the recent market action <laughs> around these levels. But, um, but that's kind of how I got to the asset. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a big believer that you need to be low on Bitcoin at every price. Um, you know, we do some very sophisticated, uh, cycle-oriented macro research here at 42 Macro that's, you know, to designed to help investors, you know, be long the things that are going up and be out of or short the things that are going down. Do we get it all right? Absolutely not. But, you know, one thing we have gotten right um, since December of last year, uh, early December, we made the pivot out of all of our digital asset exposure. Um, and knock on wood, that's been a good call. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've made, from what I've seen, a lot of great calls in the past. Thanks, man. Uh, this question, we can get uh, a little bit more into it uh, as we go along. But what is, like, your general macro outlook on markets both in the short term and in the long term going forward yeah great question man so in the short i'll start in the short term because i think it's a little bit more convoluted the range of probable outcomes is is um is a little bit more wide you know so right now the markets are debating a few things one whether or not we bottom in risk asset terms um two whether or not the fed is is, is inflected uh from a liquidity cycle perspective has the fed pivoted um to, to a more dovish posture um Three, is, is growth going to be as bad as, as initially feared, you know, going back a few weeks ago or even a couple of months ago? Um, so all those things are, are kind of up for open debate at the current juncture. Um, just in terms of how we view those, the, the answers to those questions, is we would say no, the ultimate lows and risk assets are probably not in, uh, although we may not retest them for another couple of months. Um, there's no real negative reason for that to occur until we really get into the fall. Could happen any time. I'll be clear about that. Markets do whatever the hell they're going to do. But um, we don't really see a real need for that to occur until we get into, into the fall. Um, so, no, we have not seen the ultimate lows. Uh, no, we've mo most certainly not seen an inflection uh, in the liquidity cycle. And it's our belief, particularly as we go throughout the month of August, that the Fed is going to have to start to really aggressively push back on the market's interpretation that they have done something that looks like a dovish pivot. And it may even coalesce or, or culminate uh, in a positive revision in their neutral um, Fed funds rate estimate, their neutral rate estimate, which would be a really significant negative shock to the markets, in our opinion, from the perspective of the liquidity cycle. So that's something that has our antenna up because, again, I think that's, that, that's the new battleground for debate at the highest levels of institutional finance, which I would certainly consider 42 macro um, um, up there at. And then uh, as it relates to growth, you know, the, the distribution of outcomes on growth was very, very narrowly skewed 
and negatively skewed, um, you know, going back kind of six, eight weeks ago, it has gotten less negatively skewed in recent weeks, if only because corporate earnings have held in and, and, and generally done better than feared. And more importantly, we've seen kind of, you know, a couple of data points here. I can cite the ISM services PMI. Um, you know, we're talking, we're recording on Thursday, uh, August 4th, but I'm guessing tomorrow's um, uh, jobs report is very likely to hang in there as well. So the d debate on growth is now about, hey, like, okay, if we're not crashing and falling off a cliff, when do we actually have to start to price in uh, a real legitimate recession, not just this nonsensical technical recession that, you know, that was recorded in the first half of this year. So that's kind of the short term. You know, ultimately, I do believe that, you know, markets probably have a little bit more upside to go from a risk asset perspective. Maybe you see 24, 25,000 on Bitcoin, maybe you see 4250 on the S&P 500. But beyond that, you're going to run out of gas as it relates to the medium term outlook. The medium term outlook, in my opinion, I think is a lot more, uh, a lot less, the, the distribution is a lot less um, um, symmetric. Um, in my opinion, it's a much more negatively skewed uh, distribution. You're talking about you know, the kinds of shocks that we've absorbed in the economy, both from, through the lens of interest rates and also through the lens of, of, of energy price, food and energy prices, typically result in, in, in significantly, uh, significant um, 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 drawdowns in, in, in economic output. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the general starting point. Now, we don't have the leverage cycle risk that you typically see in, a, in advance of a real deep recession. So I think the average investor, and I would tend to agree, understands that if we get a recession, it's probably going to be somewhere along the lines of your mild to moderate version as opposed to something that we saw in like the Great Depression or the global financial crisis. So that's fair. Uh, on the liquidity side, because we can, and we can, by the way, please stop me and we can unpack any of anything I'm saying with data. I just wanted to give the overarching headlines so for the listeners who are less inclined to be, uh, be nerdy about it. Um, but um, on the liquidity side, you know, our models are just continuing to show a buildup of core inflation momentum that'll keep the fans hands 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 cuffed, you know, well into the early part of next year in terms of hiking interest rates and reducing the size of its balance sheet, uh, which ultimately to those two things typically have a really negative out, out, um, impact on financial markets, you know, through, through the lens of, uh, you know, risk assets and risk appetite, risk premium, et cetera. And so if you think about kind of, you know, our base case scenario is that the Fed tightens for too long and tightens too, mu too much for too long in an economy that is already slowing, causes a more significant slowdown than it already um, is currently priced into asset markets. And ultimately, we probably need to flesh that out um, in terms of a negative market response between, let's call it some time in the early fall and the uh, kind of mid to late winter. Yeah, great points. So would you say that the market does need to like basically make new lows to force the Fed to eventually like seriously consider like a, a major pivot. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Great question. I don't think the Fed is really focused on the markets at all from that perspective because financial st stability metrics, you know, if you look at like treasury market liquidity or, you know, look at uh, repo fails and things like that, we're not at levels that would seem to suggest the Fed needs to take its eye off the inflation fight or off the employment side of its mandates um, to focus on financial stability. So, Really, the, the number one, two, three thing um, in the system right now that the Fed is focused on is inflation. Um, and then you obviously have, uh, just based on Powell's press conference last week, we are now, there's a tiny bit of a focus on growth through the lens of the labor market. But I can give you a, just a list of indicators that tell you why the Fed is, is not going to, gonna, gonna, you know, why the Fed is, is comfortable not focusing on markets between now and let's call it, six months from now. You know, I think six months from now, if things are a lot worse, a lot more shaky, they might start to concern themselves in markets. But between now and then, no. Um, so just starting with inflation, uh, as I mentioned, you know, obviously we have 9.1% headline CPI. Um, you know, if you look at the base effects for August and, and July and August in particular, you know, we had a pretty um, meaningful deceleration in inflation last, last summer uh, as a function of Delta. I want to say Delta, um, the Delta variant. And so, you know, you could get a very modest month-on-month -month improvement in inflation and still remain very elevated on a year-over-year -year rate of change basis. And even if you assume no inflation on a month-over-month -month basis between now and year end, you're still going to wind up with like 6 or 7% inflation in December. So headline inflation is kind of out the lunch for a while now. But to me, that's less, that's less exciting. The, what's more exciting, in my opinion, is this acceleration we're seeing in, in sort of core inflationary pressures. You know, you look at the Dallas Fed trim mean measure, which Fed uh, Chair Powell has really cited as, as kind of one of his, um, his favorite measures to watch, trim mean PC inflation. You know, we're at 7% on a <laughs> month-over-month annualized basis. 
you know, median CPI at around 9% month on month annualized, sticky CPI around 8%, uh, core PCEs right around 6 to 7% month over month annualized. And these are all most recent months accelerating to new highs. You know, I want to say median CPI is an all time high, sticky CPI, 40 year high in that metric, uh, 30 year high in the, in the Dallas Fed trim mean metric, 30 year high in the core PC metric. Inflation, core inflation pressure is getting worse, not better in the most recent um, 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 reports. So that's one on the inflation side. So in our opinion, you don't, you don't undo core inflationary pressure overnight. This is the kind of stuff that takes time to filter out through the system. It's going to take several quarters for us to get back towards anything that looks like 2% core inflation. So that's number one on, on, on in terms of the Fed's reaction function being more persistent and more tight than I think is currently priced in the current, the, than we know is currently priced in the, into money markets. Uh, number two on the job side, you know, so the one thing that was pretty interesting, the markets, um, you know, they were set up in June to have a positive response to the upside on positive earnings, you know, a couple of good growth data points that hung in there. But more importantly, obviously, we're seeing uh, CTAs and quants take take this and run with it. But more importantly, for, you know, we're going to get to a price where it's going to get less kind of um, kind of um, one sided from the perspective of what is the next trade? What is the next trade? I think that that price is probably somewhere around 4250 ish, 24 ish. 25,000 on Bitcoin where it's a lot less um, kind of one-sided. But going back to uh, the jobs uh, picture, we are in no man's land in terms of how tight this labor market is. Like if the Fed has said, hey, we're concerned about growth, but the reason that we're, no, so we're not concerned about growth. Sorry, they said growth is now a focus. They're now, their mandate is now dual, two-sided dual, again, as opposed to being singularly focused on inflation. Now that they're focused on growth a little bit, Let's go to the kinds of indicators that these folks have taught us to, to look at um, through the lens of their, their maximum employment mandate. You look at jolts relative to total unemployed, that's at 1.8, um, the ratio of 1.8. The pre-COVID trend in that ratio was 0 0.9, so we're double the pre-COVID trend in terms of how tight total job openings are relative to the total number of unemployed workers. So that's, a, that's off the charts. Um, you look at the private sector quits rate. Um, at 3.1%, well north of the pre-COVID trend of 2.4%. That's the percent of people who are, who are quitting their jobs, obviously, with the expectation that they're going to get a better, higher paying job. So that's basically like the opposite of the unemployment rate, basically. Um, and then you look, at, um, you look at something like the Employment Cost Index for the private sector industries, which is the broadest measure of compensation of wages, benefits, salaries, et cetera, uh, in the economy. And that number is at 5.5% year over year through Q2. The pre-COVID trend was 2.5%. So we're 300 basis points higher than the pre-COVID trend. So the Fed's going to look at the labor market and say, holy cow, this is so tight. And mind you, these are academic, you know, wonks, the PhD economists. They're super concerned about Phillips curve dynamics rearing their ugly head. I don't believe in the Phillips curve. I think it died when whoever the economist named Philip <laughs> invented it. But, um, but you know, they, they still care about it. You know, the, the wonks at the Fed care about it. So ultimately, I think we're setting mar markets are set up to have a situation in Q3, Q4 of this year where they're saying we traded up to an unsustainable level because headline inflation peaked. But because we continue to see this like build up or at the bare minimum stickiness of core inflation and labor market like overheating dynamics, this Fed is going to take an aluminum bat to the market again and beat it and beat it, beat it very aggressively, ultimately, in order to get inflation down. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I'm curious, um, Lynn Alden, who's another great macro That's analyst in, in, in the space, she posted this one thing that I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on. And I, I'm not 100% a believer in it or, you know. By the way, yes, you should take all of our words with a grain of salt. Like not one of us has a 100% track record. When we're hot, we're getting 60% of our calls right. When we're cold, we're getting, you know, 45% of our calls right. You know, that's the nature of markets. Yeah. But, you know, that I would say like when I'm cold at 45 versus the average person cold is probably 25. So that's why you listen to folks <laughs> like Lynn Alden and myself. But generally speaking, you know, at best we're, you know, two thirds right. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, she made the point about the labor market specifically and kind of like pointed out the idea that like, while like maybe the un official unemployment rate may be low and like wages, maybe wages have not necessarily kept up with inflation. Like I think you said like total compensation was up 5%, but CPI is, and I don't know if that was real or nominal, but total compensation, oh, it, it, but if it's, it's nominal, nominal yeah. Okay. If it's nominal, then, you know, CPI is up 9%. Technically everyone just got a, you know, 4% uh, 
wage cuts. So she was kind of trying to make the point that's like, what's the difference between a company cutting everyone's wages by 4%, that, that, that nominal or that real 4% versus laying off 4% of their workforce. So maybe is it possible that the, un the unemployment rate is artificially low and, and people have just received these real wage cuts over time or is you, do you not buy much, much into no, that? I, I buy into that, but there's a big difference in terms of people's consumption patterns when they lose their job versus when they're having you know negative real income growth. And don't forget that the negative real income growth is being buttressed by you know the the, the sort of increase in, 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 in private sector aggregate savings that is a function of all the fiscal stimulus we got in 2020 and 2021. So you know there's estimate I saw estimates that you know there was you know two trillion dollars of excess savings, and when we did the math on it, it was somewhere in that time in that in that realm, somewhere between two and three trillion dollars of excess savings. Now clearly the excess savings aren't going into the stock market or going into financing consumption. Largely, when you look at measures, uh, you know, uh, different surveys, et cetera, you know, from lending companies, et cetera, mortgage companies, et cetera, all the money is going to paying down debt, student debt, auto loans, you know, all this uh, mortgage debt, et cetera. Most of it is, is, is not being used for productive, um, you know, uh, productive reasons for the economy, in, in a productive capacity for the economy or asset market. So, um, you know, but I, I would generally agree, but from the perspective of corporate operating margins, there is no difference, right? <laughs> like, if you're the corporate, you know, you got you could push through nine percent inflation, but you only have to give people a five percent pay, pay uh, increase in their in their total compensation. That's fantastic. That that is actually a really positive outcome for a company. But ultimately, that only takes you so far because all it means is you're going to have a a real significant erosion in uh in, in consumer purchasing power and and even B two B purchasing power. Right? It's not just consumers. You know, PPI is up extremely high as well. You know, like Google. You know, if you sell something to Google, Google squeezing you too, or if you, you know, like. Um, for example, so, um, you know, this is the, at the end of the day, when you have negative real income growth in one or more sectors of the economy, it's not a sustainable outlook for, you know, earnings to remain robust or operating margins to remain robust. It just means that you're probably going to decay and, and decay to a, a, a much worse state. Yeah, definitely. I want to touch on something that you mentioned at the beginning, how you said how Bitcoin was this asset that kind of led the S&P back in 2018 when the Bitcoin fell from 6K to, to 3K. And then we kind of saw in March 2020, Bitcoin hit that wick to the 3,000 mark uh, temporarily before the S&P 500 hit its bottom. So do you think Bitcoin will hit a bottom again before traditional like U.S. equities? Or, and what are your thoughts on yeah, all that? Yeah, so let's, let's be, um, let me, let me, let me uh, elucidate this a little bit better. Bitcoin is a much better leading indicator uh, from the perspective of time in the market and liquidity cycle at the peak of the cycle. You, know, you go back to um, December 2017 and, and the highs in Bitcoin relative to the September 18 highs in the stocks, or you go to, that was a nine-month lead. You had uh, the peak in Bitcoin in November of 2021 and the highs in the stock market, the S&P 500, uh, in January 2022. So that was a two-month lead. But when you look at the blows, you know, Bitcoin bottomed out in Q4 18, I want to say a week before the stock market did. And it bottomed out in, um, in, 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 May, in March of 2020, a week before the stock market did. So it's a much more slightly leading to coincident indicator at the lows, but it's a real meaningful leading indicator at the highs. So um, I don't expect Bitcoin to bottom significantly before the stock market, um, but I certainly do believe that when we get into the next bull phase and bull run, Bitcoin will probably peak out. Because again, this is what happens all the time. I have this saying, um, so I'm sure some of the listeners probably have heard me say this, but liquidity dries up at the margins. It dries up at the fringes. Like when the, the more speculative an asset is, or the, the less institutionalized an asset is, the more the reduction in liquidity hits it. And eventually it works its way back to the S&P 500, investment grade credit, the treasury market, you know, things that are much more institutionalized. So that's why Bitcoin peaks well in advance of the S&P. But the reason it bottoms coincidentally is because everything tends to bottom coincidentally with the inflection in the liquidity cycle. You know, you know, the liquidity dries up slowly at the top and eventually the Fed's hiking rates and pulling in its balance sheet. But when it flicks the switch back on, it's like this one monolithic thing. So that tends to be what happens. So uh, ultimately, the Fed is going to have to pivot. Um, we suspect the Fed pivot is probably going to come sometime in Q1 of next year, um, you know, after they've seen enough damage to the economy and asset markets. But, you know, sitting here in August, early August of 2022, that seems like a career way. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. What are your so what are your general thoughts like on the housing market? Like if the Fed does pivot in Q one of next year, 
will that like give enough time for real estate prices to really fall significantly or, or what do you oh, think? Great question, man. So, um, so one, no, it's very unlikely we see real estate prices fall significantly. What is more likely to happen is the growth uh, of, of home price appreciation will slow significantly. Like we're still tracking it around, around 19 to 20% year over year. Uh, pick your metric, whether you look at FIFA or whether you look at the S and P CoreLogic K Shiller data. So that, that's a problem. Um, but the one thing that good news, I guess, if you if you will, the good news is the housing market uh, on the purchase side is in recession. I mean, pretty deep, significant recession. I mean, this is um, you look at um, housing starts at down forty percent annualized, building permits which lead housing starts down forty percent annualized. So like that stuff's going to filter through into into purchase activity and, and, and demand. So um, that's an issue for housing, for the like the actual sector of the economy, and one of the reasons we're going to see growth continue to slow um, over this couple of quarters. Housing is a very significant leading indicator uh, for the broader economy, but you tend not to see house price outright declines. You'd have to get into a really negative situation from a liquidity cycle standpoint for us to see outright declines, and I'm not sure that that is of the cards from this particular point in time. I mean, we already seen the biggest shock we've ever seen in, in mortgage rates. Um, if you look at it on a trailing three years Z-score basis, is the biggest shock we've ever seen, probably bigger than the shock we saw in 2007, which caused the housing bubble. Now, the reason that caused the housing, um, uh, unwind to the housing bubble, and it's probably not going to cause the unwind of the housing price appreciation here, is because you had a bunch of adjustable rate mortgages back then that ultimately were sort of, um, you know, sold to people and, and capitalized by failing banks. So that's a big different setup than what we have today. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So with all the talk about like, are we in a recession? Do no, is, 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 you know, we're we have, not. we've had a technical we're, recession we're a technical maybe, recession, but, yeah. or, you know, the two quarters, but then, you know, people say like, we're not in a recession. Do you think we are in a recession or are we not in a recession? I think it's unequivocal that we're not in a recession. I don't think it's a legitimate debate. I mean, it's, we are technically, we, we recorded a technical recession in the second quarter or in the first and second quarter of 2022. It is August. So by definition, we're no longer in the technical recession. So now the question should be, are we in an actual recession? I, I, to be unequivocally, no. I mean, you look at the, the PMIs, you look at the, the, you know, we just printed a 57 more or less on the ISM services, 53 on ISM manufacturing. Those are way too high for us to be in a recession. You're talking about, you know, mid to low 40s if you're talking about recessionary prints. Now, we're, I think we're headed there. The linear indicators, you look at our rate shock analysis, look at base effects, you look at where we are in the broader cycles. Um, particularly through the lens of the liquidity cycle, it's very likely we wind up in recession. I just don't think we're quite there yet. I mean, we print it. You know, Powell even said it himself. And, you know, to be fair uh, to, to Powell or to be unfair to Powell, he cited the wrong – he cited the right statistic to push back that we are currently in recession, which is we created 2.7 million jobs in the first half of the year, probably going to create another three to 400,000 here in, 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 the, in the jobs report we're going to get tomorrow for July. So we're probably not in recession. The reality is, however, is that the labor market is a lagging indicator relative to the broader growth cycle. So it's conceivable that you have job growth um, in the early outset of a recession. Um, it's just it's just unlikely that if we continue to stick at these levels or you know decay gradually from these levels that we are in one. But shout out to um, uh, Jim Bianco, a great investor uh, who's called out that we've seen you know going back to the recessions that we saw in the seventies. Uh, you know, we had a recession in 69, 70, 73, 75, and then uh, 79, 80. Um, you know, each of those recessions saw job growth on a, on a ratio basis to the total not uh, total size of the labor force. That was fairly coinc or, or commensurate with what we're seeing today. So could we be in recession? Sure. Yes. Why not? We won't know until years later, until the NBAR dates it. But just looking at the broader compendium of indicators, jobs, labor market, industrial production, retail sales, probably not. I still think it's coming though. Yeah. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Like, do you think it really matters? Like, or is this all like a semantics game of calling certain things a recession and certain, certain things not a recession? Like, is it more important to like just monitor asset prices or figure out like how bad consumers are hurting? Joe, you, that's the best question anybody's asked me all year. Congratulations, man. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, I don't know if I can say this on your podcast, but you can edit it out, but no shit. <laughs> like at the end of the day, it's not about whether we go into recession or not. It's about where are you on the sign curve for major cycles that matter, like growth, inflation, liquidity, pro corporate profits. Like those things are cyclical. You know, they're on a sign curve. So it's not really about, hey, on this particular interval in the sign long term sign curve, series time series of the sign curve, 
it's you know it's negative we don't really care i just need to care if it's going up or down and trending higher or trending lower like the markets function on the rate two things uh, primarily on the rate of change which means you know how things are it's not whether or not something's good or bad but is it getting better or getting worse that's the primary kind of driver of markets and then the secondary driver of markets particularly in a very short time intervals is you know are things actually better or worse than expected um, you know, like you get a jobs report tomorrow, is it significantly better or significantly worse? Because those better or worse than expected could cause, you know, significant DV or significant revisions to the consensus view of the direction of travel, which is ultimately the, the main driver of markets. So, um, you know, typically, you know, we, you know, I don't know if we've, um, and maybe I've done this with, uh, with you guys in the past, but, you know, we run this, um, you know, sophisticated regime segmentation process called the grids um, that sort of look at the two main cycles that matter, growth and inflation, that tend to drive the, you know, kind of the inflections in the liquidity cycle and inflections in the profit cycle. And so we're very, you know, clearly been trending higher on inflation, trending lower in growth. And that puts you in what we call inflation. That's the I in the grid. Uh, we're likely to transition to deflation, which is where both growth and inflation are slowing simultaneously. That puts you in the D in the grid. And the problem with that for asset markets is that the Fed's response to that has historically been positive. You go into the D. The issue with that is that inflation, just from a levels perspective, because again, the Fed doesn't function on rate of change, the markets do. From a levels perspective, the Fed is still seeing a buildup in core inflation pressure and a labor market that is overheating by double, and they're probably going to tighten into this deflation outcome, growth down, inflation down, for way longer than they should, and that has historically been quite, quite negative for asset markets. Yeah, makes sense. I know you have a lot of like great macro insights and I'm, I'm curious to hear if you have a, an opinion on this. If you don't, it's fine. Do you have like a very long-term vision of, of how you see Bitcoin in maybe 10 to 20 years? Like, do you always envision it as this maybe digital gold asset that people use as, as savings or, or, or like a liquidity measure? Or do you ever envision it being an actual like currency or, or medium of exchange in, in the very uh, No, I mean, the price is too high for it to be a currency or medium of exchange, right? I mean, I guess you can trade units of Bitcoin, but I don't know. It's, 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 the, it's too volatile to be a medium of exchange. You can't walk into Starbucks, wait in line, and have your coffee, you know, double or triple in price or get cut in half in price because, you know, the price of Bitcoin is going, right? That's not, a, that's not a good outcome for anybody, right? Um, and so, like, so no, but I do believe there is a significant opportunity ahead of us in terms of the institutional adoption. And the reason I say that is, you know, we run a very sophisticated uh, model to predict um, lo the longer term trend in inflation, the stationary mean of inflation. Um, you know, we call it our secular inflation model. And that model has 16 different variables looking at things like the Fed balance sheet, fit, you know, fiscal uh, budget deficit, fiscal debt, you know, um, um, you know, the globalization is one of the big factors that are moving uh, right now, demographics, et cetera. But there are 16 kind of structural factors in that model that are telling the model that, hey, look, core PCE is likely to be 50 to 100 basis points higher on a trend basis in this decade relative to the prior decade. So we were, you know, 1.8% on a trend uh, stationary mean was 1.8%. And uh, in, the two th in the 2010s, the model saying, hey, it's probably going to be somewhere between 2.3 and 2.8%. So let's just say it's at the high end of that range, 2.8%, the 100 basis points higher. That is a, doesn't sound like a lot, but that is a significant you know, revision to, to inflation. That's like a 50%, we're going to have 50% more inflation in this decade than we did prior decade, which means you're, the 60 concept of the 60-40 portfolio, yeah, it may continue to work, particularly once we get below 5% headline CPI. That tends to be where the, the stocks and bonds have an inverse correlation. But beyond that, you know, this concept that we're going to just eat a 50% revit positive revision to inflation, I don't think institutional investors are going to take that lightly. And so to me, I think the Fed, the number one question that I think the, that needs to be answered this decade, and I'm not, not sure anyone really has the answer, is whether or not the Fed acquiesces to that or not. Well, the Fed, knowing that, I don't know if they know this, you know, I don't, they, don't, they don't have our model, but I guess they can pay for it and certainly do present to them. So hopefully they're paying attention. <laughs> um, you know, when they, when they if, if there is, let's call it, let's just say that that is fact. If there is... 50% more inflation, we're going to get 3% inflation in the system, but they have a 2% inflation target. Are they going to fight back every time this thing is persistently above 2%? And if so, we're going to see a significantly, um, uh, we're going to see the economy not reach its potential from a GDP growth perspective. We're going to see asset markets, particularly risk assets, really struggle because it means the liquidity cycle is going to remain persistently tight for a really long period of time. 
The other alternative is the Fed acknowledges that, hey, look, we're in a higher inflationary regime. We're going to just take our foot off the brakes a little bit and allow inflation to be effectively kind of trend at 3%, which would be a positive revision to their 2% inflation target. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, because if they do the latter, i.e. rise, revise up their inflation target, you're, you're I mean, the, the, the 40 that everyone's got in their portfolio for bonds has to go to at least 30, probably 20, right? Like, because again, bonds at these prices, at these valuations don't support inflation at that level. You know, they support inflation at the one and a half to two percent level that we're used to on core PCE, not the two and a half to three percent level that the model is currently saying is the most likely outcome. So I don't know the answer to that, but I do know if we ever move in a direction where it looks like the Fed is kind of getting, I don't know, acquiescing to this higher level of inflation, either explicitly by revising up their inflation forecast or their inflation target or implicitly by just sort of being more dovish than they probably should. Bitcoin's not going to go through the through the moon. Not the, screw the moon. It's going to go to Neptune, um, because again, there's going to be such a huge asset allocation out of fixed income and into commodities, both physical and digital. And Bitcoin's obviously going to be the leader in the digital asset space. Yeah. So if inflation does remain elevated, like you, you're potentially uh, saying it, it possibly could, you think Bitcoin and, and obviously commodities is a good. Uh, another asset class to replace that, you know, some part of the 40% of bonds that, you know, the 60, 40, 40 portfolio that, you know, has been traditional for in finance for, for many, many years. What other assets would you allocate if, if you're taking bonds down from 40 to, to 20 Bitcoin, gold, or Probably. what else, or would you put gold I mean, into it to get in that category as a, or not? as a retail investor or even just as a family office, but like it's, it's, Farmland to me is like the obvious benefactor there. Um, you know, it was a clearly like rumblings of global food shortages and crises, and those things are only going to get worse in the future as you know we continually try to you know transition the world from fossil fuel to green energy, and that process is not going to go well in terms of like the price of fossil fuel. So like you, know, the, you raise the price of fossil fuel on a persistent basis, you're going to raise the cost, the price of producing any commodity, including food. I mean, it's just it's such a big input. Um, to, to the commodity production broadly. So um, I think farmland is going to have a lot of value. Um, obviously, we keep making babies and making kids. So, you know, the growth rates, you know, in developed markets are in terms of birth rates have, have gone down. But, you know, the, 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 they've been offset by very aggressively high birth rates in, you know, places like sub-Saharan Africa, India, South America, et cetera. So um, there's a lot more people in the world and we got to feed them. So um, if, I'm, if you put a gun to my head, if you told me to like, Dragon portfolio, pick four assets that'll survive over the next like decade. I'm going Bitcoin, farmland, um, whatever industry like is getting government subsidies because I think there's going to be a lot more fiscal policy response. So maybe it's like green energy, like whoever builds wind turbines or I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't want to answer that question now. And then I think, you know, the more we get, you know, sort of, if we have another pandemic, then it's going to be all hell's going to break loose from a perspective of like the undercapitalization we're seeing in, in the healthcare space. So uh, I'd say something along the lines of the healthcare, we got old people and pandemics, government handouts from fiscal stimulus in terms of green transition, Bitcoin and farmland. Those are like the four things. Nice. I'm dragging I before. like it. So. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So I guess we can go ahead and, and wrap this up. Where can the audience go to find more about you and, and more about 42 uh, Before Macro? we even wrap up, I was going to make sure you can't drag in portfolio in real life because the problem in real life and certainly anybody listening to a podcast about investing, you're probably going to make a lot more investment decisions along the way. Some will be hazardous to your financial objectives. Others will be you know beneficial to your financial objectives. The reality is if we could just buy things and come back 10 years later, we'd all be Warren Buffett. The problem is we don't have that ability to do that. We have the ability to access our accounts and the and the desire to access our accounts because it's what we do as people. We're human beings. We have behavioral heuristics that are preventing us from being Warren Buffett. So at the end of the day, this is uh, going back to your question. You know, we uh, services like mine, uh, Forty Two Macro, um, are designed to help investors fight their own behavioral heuristics by using data, by using a deep understanding of, you know, the critical cycles that matter, the things that don't get you blown up in financial markets. So, you know, we're weaponizing data, we're weaponizing a wealth of, you know, industry and, um, you know, experience, and ultimately to help investors achieve their objectives, despite their own, you know, kind of, you know, shortcomings as, as human beings, as, you know, with these heuristics. So um, come check us out, 42macro.com. 
Um, you know, uh, if you can't afford the research, you know, it's, um, <laughs> I think we're very reasonably priced considering we put out institutional quality research on uh, six days a week. But um, to the extent that it's not uh, everyone's price point, we definitely put out a decent amount of content on our, on our Twitter feed, 42 Macro, D Dale, D D A L E, and on our YouTube channel, 42 Macro.com or 42 Macro. So appreciate the opportunity to connect with the, uh, the listeners and look forward to next time. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Darius. Enjoyed the yeah, conversation. Appreciate you, man. Thank you.